morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Welcome, especially the visitors. It's wonderful to have you with us this morning. Pastor and his family are traveling this morning, and I just want you to know I have my blue Honda out in the parking lot for all those (laughs) questions. If you know me, that means I drove the blue Honda Civic and the motorcycles are sitting in the garage. It was one below this morning, so give me a break. It was really cold. So, but it's cold, and I'm not sure if Puxatani Phil saw his shadow or not, but I think we'd all agree it's high time for winter to move on, and uh, whether it is or that. We worship this morning, as you notice in the bulletin, uh, with the opening hymn, an insert in your bulletin, It is in keeping with our reading of the gospel, Jesus' presentation at the temple, and we begin by singing, To your temple, Lord, I come. Turn to the front of the hymnal, page 167. Read responsibly the invocation, the confession, and the absolution. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, Amen. 
Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Son was this day presented in the temple in the substance of our flesh. Grant that we may be presented to you with pure and clean hearts through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading. The Old Testament reading for today is 1 Samuel 1, beginning with the 21st verse. The man Ikala and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkinah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him by up with her, along with three-year-old bull, an alpha of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh and the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the <coughs> Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I may to him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. We read Psalm 84 responsibly by whole verse. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh for joy of the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are in the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The earth is also risen to the pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is one who trusts in you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle lesson for today is found in Hebrews 2, beginning at the 14th verse. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the Holy Gospel. <laughs> according to St. Luke, the second chapter. And when the time came for the purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated for the hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is the Gospel lesson of Luke 2. We hear simply the very ending. Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms, blessed God, and said, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Here ends our text. Please be seated. Dear Christian friends, a little over 100 years ago, the fledgling auto industry in America had a huge problem. How to make more cars faster, cheaper. They could make cars, but it was slow and expensive. Because if you hired machinists to machine every part to fit every other part, well, you could do it, and many of the early cars were that way. But you couldn't make them fast, you couldn't make them cheap. Henry Leland is famous in old car history for coming up with a series of inventions, and I'll tell you about one of them. By the way, Henry Leland, interesting man, a machinist who founded both Cadillac and Lincoln. Isn't that interesting? One man started both companies, sold Cadillac off, started another company, sold that one, and on and on. Well, here is his solution. Now, this is going to shout fifth grade science project. I totally felt that way making it yesterday. This is an engine block. Okay, it's a box wrapped in tin foil with an orange juice can in the middle. But think fifth grade science project. Think of this as an engine block, and it's solid metal, and this is one of probably four cylinders that is holes cast in the block. You have to decide if that's exactly the right size for the pistons that's going to slide in it. Well, if you're a master machinist like Henry Leland, you would get out your micrometers and other tools and you would carefully measure. That's too slow. And it's way too expensive to have machinists decide this. And so one of the innovations that they came up with was the go-no-go -no -go block. It's a gauge block. Now this is a hunk of oak that I turned in the lathe uh, yesterday. Think metal, precision ground, with one side a slightly smaller diameter than the other end. And what could you do? Well, you'd stick the small end, and if it goes in, good. Now, if the hole in the engine block is so small that even the small end won't go in, you reject it, too small. If the small end goes in, you just turn it around and see if the big end goes in, and it shouldn't. And that's why they called it a go, no-go block. If the big end goes in, then they bore the hole too big, you reject that one. But the perfect one is a go, no, no-go, and that's perfect. Now why all this history lesson and fifth grade science? Doesn't Simeon strike you as the ultimate quality inspector of the spiritual world? Here's a man who's stationed in the temple has been told he's going to see the one child who passes the exam and who is actually the Messiah that the world's been waiting for for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. He must have seen more than one child. He must have had a test, go, no go, that said this is the one. And the good news is he got it right. He's passed on the news to us. This is the Messiah, the child we've been waiting for. He even passes on to us, and we've sung it for, well, generations. That very ending we just heard. Now I can go in peace. I have seen your salvation. That's good news. So how did Simeon know? Can you even know? And how do we know that that's the one who passes the test? Well, let's go think. You know, Simeon didn't have a long time to do it. He takes the baby up in his arms, and he knows. Now, he has the advantage of the Holy Spirit is telling him, this is the one. But can you do that? Can you look at someone and either no go or no go on somebody? We do. We do. I was dating a girl in college. My mom had never met her. She saw her walking up the sidewalk to the farmhouse, looked out the kitchen window, and said, I don't like her. <laughs> right there. When months later she wrote me a Dear John letter, that's how old I am, we had actually Dear John letters. My mother couldn't help but say, see, I told you, Danny, no good. No, it, it didn't take long. 
I gotta tell you, because I'm a happy dad, our son got married last Saturday in Denton, Texas. Oh, we had a wonderful time. Months, 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 months ago, we met Natalie, our now daughter-in-law, which is still strange to say, because it's the first wedding of our three kids. We had one big question. Is she the right girl to marry Steve? You know, all parents have that question. And I tell you what, it didn't take long, maybe a minute, and we said, she's the one. She's wonderful. She really is a wonderful, wonderful young lady. And so, you can do that, can't you? Just one short look and you've kind of made up your mind on someone. Simeon did. He has this infant for just a moment. So how do you know? Well, I think we can get rid of any idea that there was something, I mean, physically different. That Jesus was warmer or heavier or he glowed or, you know, something that everybody could see. Now, Simeon has the advantage again. The Spirit has said, you're going to see the Messiah. And surely the Spirit is, of course, pointing, telling him, this is the one. But how do we know? How does he know? That's where I think our little block is going to help us. Let's start with the go side. He had the right dimension. Think of who came into Simeon's arms. An infant. Eight days old. How small was the dimension that he fit? He not only fit the expectation he's just been born, but where did he have his birth? I'll just leave it there. In the tight confines, he was born in a stable. He was laid in a manger. You know, for the God of the universe, that's a very small specification, isn't it? An awfully tight confine. And he fulfilled it. Amazing. And still as an infant, he's brought to the temple to fulfill what the law had demanded. Isn't that an amazing, again, small specification? If you're God of the universe, do you have to come and follow the rules? He did. In fact, throughout his life, he's going to do that. I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. Isn't that strange that he holds himself to the small specifications of that law that was given to us, but he puts himself within it. But it's more than just that. At this moment, eight days in the temple, he fulfills that small speck. Oh, but he does it all through his life, doesn't he? For 30 years, he's going to constrain, constrain himself to the carpenter shop. He's going to limit himself to be known nothing more than Joseph's son, the carpenter. And go no further than that tiny place, Nazareth. Isn't that remarkable? And then, when he begins his ministry, when we imagine that he would be always only famous and powerful, again, the smallness. He's the one who's going to say, birds have nests and foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. How small was his gathering? But you know, it really comes down to the end, doesn't it? What's the ultimate tiny specification that fits him? He made of himself nothing, Paul says. But he took on the role of a servant. And being made obedient, he humbled himself to death, even the death on the cross. Isn't that an awfully tight, tight specification to fit? He would take himself, all that he's done, and reduce himself to this, condemned. He could speak in his own behalf, he says nothing. And he limits himself to the cross as his throne and a grave as his end. Who would think that you could compress God into that tiny, tiny space of a tomb? But he did. Go. What an amazing dimension but then you just take it out and turn it around. And there's a wonderful no-go. By the way, Holly said, you're not gonna actually do that. I said, if I get away with it, honey, I think I'm gonna do it. <laughs> and it stands there. Let's see how long it'll stay. <laughs> it doesn't fit. Isn't that the wonderful other side of this dimension of Jesus? He's too big. It doesn't fit. It's been eight days since his birth. We demonstrated the manger and the stable, the smallness. 
But wait, there's that other side. For eight days, the shepherds who saw the angels split open the heavens must have been telling their story. How could you possibly see that and not tell that story over and over and over again to every person that was just miles away from Jerusalem? I wonder if Simeon had heard the story that there was a night just eight days ago when the sky split open and every angel in the choir sang. The shepherds saw it. His dimensions are too big for any single simple child. Doesn't that continue? After those 30 confining years of in the carpenter's shop, he goes to be baptized. And while there are many being baptized, this one is different, isn't he? He's too large for that crowd. And when he's baptized, the heavens split open again, and the Father says, this is my beloved Son. And his ministry begins. And it grows, doesn't it? It grows so that there are spellbound crowds listening to him when he speaks the words of the Sermon on the Mount. There are crowds who forget themselves so thoroughly that though they're in the thousands, they have no food for themselves, but they hang on his words until he feeds them. There's the wind and the waves that roar across the sea, and he says to them simply, be still. And they are. And it's a dimension of power so much that the disciples who are with them say simply, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. He casts out demons who call themselves legion. There are so many of them. And he says simply, be gone. And they're gone. And he raises the dead. He says to Lazarus, dead in the tomb for four days, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man walks out. Isn't this a dimension too big for any constriction? Isn't this a dimension too big for any past specifications of what we would expect? This one is simply too big. And that's the good news. Because when he was willingly confined himself into the tomb, after three days, it couldn't hold him anymore. And after three days, he said simply, enough. And he breaks out of that tomb, and it's simply too small to hold the one who is life himself, who is the resurrection and that life. That's who he is. Isn't that a wonderful both and? We need both don't we? In terms of the specifications of the Savior who comes to save us in the world. And listen, we just had those both and in the Hebrews passage just before this. Remember that in verse 17 of Hebrews it says, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are tempted. Did you hear that? In essence, it's saying it's the go, no go gauge we've been speaking of. He had to be made like us in every respect. That's this tiny end. Trouble is spiritual claustrophobia, but it's real. Trouble is the world closing in on you, but it's not an illusion. It's real. Every one of us has been in a actual claustrophobia of trouble that's pressing in on us on all sides. And it's a tiny place. Here's the amazing thing. He put himself into that tiny confine that we found ourselves in. Exactly. He fills it to the bottom of the cylinder of the trouble we're in. But here's the good news. He doesn't come just to say, oh, I've been there too. Or I fit myself into the same powerless place. But listen to the other end. Because he himself has suffered, he is able to help those who are tempted, and he rises above that trouble. We don't really simply only want a God who commiserates with us, and that's good. But don't we also want a God who says, call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you? That's good. Don't we want a God who says to us, be still and know that I am God? Don't we want a God who says, cast your cares on him, for he cares about you? Who does more than just wring his hand beside us, but opens up his hands and lifts us up with him. That's the good news. He is the both and, and we need them both. Simeon saw that, and by the Spirit he knew it. He knew it enough to be able to say those last words in our text, stay, 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 stay.
stay. It was staying in the shop perfectly. There we go, stay. He ended with these last words, Now you let your servant depart in peace according to your word. My eyes have seen your salvation that you prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and to glory for your people Israel. Simeon, you got to see it. But here's the good news. It's not just a promise to Simeon. He saw it for us. But the whole record of the Gospels is for the same purpose. John said the same thing for all of us. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and believing have life in his name. And so the same promise with the same effect comes to us. We've seen him fit himself into the tiniest places, into our troubles, and into a death we'd never imagined. And we've also seen him expand beyond any imagined power we would have a power that overcomes death, that moves the stones, and takes us with him. You had it right, Simeon, and you say it for us all. Lord, let your servant depart in peace. My eyes have seen your salvation. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the confession of our faith, with the words of the creed. Please stand as we confess the creed, the Nicene Creed, on page 174. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for our son and conscious Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in the glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. Who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and a solid church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. You've sent your Son. He has confined himself to the smallest places, he's confined himself to be born, to be born in a stable and laid in a manger. He's confined himself to keeping of the law. He has confined himself to service, not for his sake, but for ours, finally even to the cross and to the grave. He has confined himself to our troubles and has reached the very bottom of them long before we have experienced the very beginning. Thank you that he has made himself little, that he might find us. But also we give you thanks that he sent your, you sent your son, and he is mighty in power. And at his birth, the heavens broke open, and every angel sang. And at his baptism, you split the heavens and affirmed he is your son. He shines like the sun of transfiguration, and he rises from the dead. And no stone, no grave, no death can hold him, for he is simply too large. And so he says also to us in our troubles, that though he knows the very bottom of them, he has also raised us up out of them, and that we can be still and put ourselves into his hands, for he, with great power, cares about us. Thank you for the sending of your son and for also hearing all our other concerns. We celebrate with those who have birthdays. We think of Tegan McGuire's birthday, seven years old. Thank you for seven years and continue to watch over Tegan and give many, many, many more years to come. We pray for those who are sick. We think of those who are ill. We pray for Vivian Block, Joy Garlock, Richard Frinke, Jumps Gudmundson, who are in hospice care, also, we pray for Paul Winger, Paul Roser, Roberta Roser, and all others that we name in our own minds and our circle of acquaintances. Lord, put your healing hand upon them according to your will. 
Make treatments effective to them. And while they wait for healing, also give them faith and patience, confidence and trust in you. All these things in your care for all others that are worrisome to us, but known to you. We ask in your name, pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated for the offering. Continue with the offertory. Please stand.
be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift hands to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those who you have created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, 
in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.